You got to know this guy's Samson. Glad to be with you another Tuesday afternoon. There's so much to be said from the teachings of the Bible. Uh, we have discussed knowledge, a factor, F-A-C-T-R, in authority. And, 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 and what we need to get an understanding of is that man has wars all the time. But what we also need to get an understanding of is this. There are Christians that God has deemed to know him in an invisible spiritual realm on the realm of righteousness. And then there are spirits that combat God's children. In this invisible realm, you cannot take the natural facilities or the natural uh, attributes of mankind and fight an invisible Satan, principalities, rulers of darkness. What you have to combat him with is the spiritual things of God. So what God did, he equipped a person to be born once naturally and once born again spiritually. Being born again spiritually requires that, Romans 10, 9, you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. That just births you in to salvation. But Ephesians 4 comes into play where he gives you the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher to edify, which means to educate because knowledge of God is going to be your authority. No knowledge of God, no authority of God. Now, I'm going to say some things, and I, I, I want you to, 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 to keep with me because I'm going somewhere. When the Bible started, God deemed not Travis to go into the garden. He didn't deem uh, Miss Broomscraw to go into the garden. He deemed Adam and Eve into the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the garden. Uh, the tree of life was in the garden. That's who God deemed to put in the garden. At the time that God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them a purpose. And when he explained their purpose, they didn't have to do what Moses was going to do. They had to only do what God asked them to do and obey God. That's all they needed to know. What Satan did when Satan questioned them, Satan added to what God said with his subtlety. And so instead of them just sticking with what God told them to do, they began to debate with Satan and what he was talking about. You are saying, well, where are you going with this? Here's where I'm going with this. We come to Noah. Noah was asked by God, build a ark. Noah said, yes, Lord. Was Noah perfect? No. But what Noah had was that he was of a pure bloodline to produce Christ and that he obeyed God. When people didn't know what rain was, Noah looked like a fool building an ark talking about it was going to rain because mankind didn't even know what rain was. But Noah, anyway, carried out what God asked him to do. Let me speed it up a little bit. Moses, Aaron, did what God asked them to do, and God empowered them to do it. What did he ask Solomon to do? He, David, he wouldn't let David build a temple because he had too much blood on his hands, so he let Solomon build the temple. So, Solomon built the temple. What did he ask Joshua to do? He had Joshua was asked to take Israel over into the promised land. Moses didn't take them over into the promised land. Moses led them away from Egypt. Joshua carried them into the promised land. So here we are in 2020. Ephesians says that God has elected a group of people, predestined a group of people, 
and sent a apostle to that group of people for the pastor teacher to teach what Apostle Paul was told by God to tell this group of people called the Gentiles. What God wanted the Gentiles to do, he sent Paul to reveal to them in the word of the Bible called the Holy Scriptures what was expected of the Gentiles. For instance, Ephesians 1. No, let's go to Ephesians 6, 10, and back up to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 6, 10 say, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Let's look at that. In order for us to combat Satan, we cannot do it with the natural man. So God here in Ephesians 6, because there's only six chapters in Ephesians, God here subsequently is asking the people that he has predestined before the foundation of the world, I want you to be strong in me. I don't want you to use your power. Your power is no good against Satan. I want you to be strong in me and in the power of my might. Now, why would God be talking to me about being strong in him? I'm glad you asked. Let's go right to Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul was the apostle. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints. He said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Oedipus and to the faithful in Jesus Christ. Now, we were not in Oedipus, but we're the faithful in Jesus Christ. So he's speaking to us. Grace be to you. Peace from God the Father, our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Creator is giving you grace and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is giving you grace. Let's read on. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, that means that everything that God is going to do with every blessing is in Christ in heaven. Every spiritual blessing. So therefore, we can't rent a spaceship and travel to heaven. So we operate on that realm where those spiritual blessings is by faith. By faith. We have the spiritual blessings. We use the spiritual blessing. We're supplied with the first spiritual blessing by faith. By faith in what God said out of these holy scriptures. Let, let, let's move on. According as he has chosen us, it says now he chose us. In him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless without blame before him in love. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He, according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Wherefore he has a bound towards us. All wisdom, knowledge, a factor in authority. All wisdom. Then he goes on to say, Nine, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he has pur purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will, that we should be the that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Whom first trusted in Christ. I got to make a, a, a point note right there. Israel did not accept Christ as the Messiah. A few Israelites became saved Christians. But the majority of Israel did not accept Jesus Christ. 
Here's what he said right there. Grace, miss, wherefore also have I heard of, no, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Who first trusted in Christ. And him ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. After you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, does that mean that because you were chosen by God, that you were sealed by God, does that mean that you don't have anything to do but just become saved? No, that's not true. Here's what's true. When God asks you to put on put on the whole put out the old man and put on the new man, that's something you have to do. When God asks you to cast out the works of the darkness, Revelate, I mean Romans 13, 12, that's something you have to do. When God asks you to put on the armor of light, that's something you have to do. When God asks you to put on the new man, Ephesians 4, 24, that's something you have to do. Now, God is asking you to put out, put on. God is asking you to put out the body of the flesh, Colossians 2, 11. Put to death your memories. Then he goes on, put out the old man with his doings, Colossians 3, 19. 3, 9. Now, these are things God is asking you to do, and you will be asking the question, God, what would you want me to do? You got your hands full. If you were putting out that old man, listen to me, listen to me. If you were 20 years old when you confessed, Romans 10, 9, and 10, that you are a Christian, now that you are a Christian, you have been living 19 years and some months being you, using your conscience and your appetite and your desires, doing whatever you wanted to do, when you wanted to do it. Now that you have been born again, you have to accept what God is saying through the word, being sealed with the Holy Spirit. It is you that must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him. It is you that must begin from one day to the next to put off the old man so you can begin to think like Christ, to put on the new man. Because number one, you've been born again into the kingdom of God as a spiritual being. That's why he's telling us in Ephesians 6, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and spirit and, and rulers and principalities and rulers of darkness and demons and imps. And we are fighting Satan's kingdom. But I've never seen like the church wants to fight the church and then let Satan tear their family up, tear their finances up. They won't fight him, but they'll fight flesh and blood. But they won't fight Satan. No Christian has a right to fight or debate or even fight with flesh and blood. Our job is the spirit realm. Now, we're going to Ephesians 4, and I want to show you something. In Ephesians 4, here's what God said. God says, and he gave some apostles. Okay, let's stop right there. He gave some apostles. This is Apostle Paul's writings in Ephesians we are reading. What Apostle Paul tells me, Apostle Paul told me, and Acts 9 is my point of reference. Apostle Paul told me in Acts 9 that God knocked him down as Saul on the road to the masters. Revealed to him two-thirds of the New Testament. I read Paul's writings but I don't have all the understanding of Paul's writings. But there's one thing I do know. I can never close my mind to what Paul is saying because Paul's view and Paul's revelation is higher than mine. So I get in part what Paul is saying, but I never get completely. But I have a wider view than most people of what Paul is saying because of my study to understand that knowledge is authority. So my study and my hunger and my thirst is because I want to know all that
that God wants me to know because I am a teacher preacher. I did not give this to myself. Whatever God gave you, he gave to you. But well, whatever he gave to me, he gave to me. So what I do is I share my gift with the different people in the body of Christ because the many member body shares and works their gifts together. So here's what he said. He said, I give you the apostle. We're going to deal with the apostle Paul. An apostle is a sent one. In order for me to know that you are not false, I'm not calling anybody that want to call themselves an apostle false, but the one thing I will stand on tonight, I know that I know that I know that I know that Apostle Paul is apostle sent by God because he's in the 66 books of the Bible. I'm not questioning what message Apostle Bitty Bitty got. What I'm a questioning is, what can the apostle in the church today do in serving God that a pastor teacher can't do? Why do they exalt themselves above a pastor teacher when they can't come with a new message? They got to read the message of the Bible. So what makes them an apostle above pastor teacher? I can tell you, exalting themselves. Let's move on. Here's what he said. Some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. Here's why he gave us the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastor teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Let me ask you a question. Where in there did it tell you that he made you the pastor teacher for an anniversary? Where did it tell you in there that he had gave you the revelation that you need to drive your people like they some kind of animals and disrespect your people and lie to your people and tell your people? Let me tell you about tithe and offering. Number one is tithe and offering does not belong to the man of the church. It belongs to God. Number two is we have gotten so far off base with what we are doing in this season, we don't even look Christ-like. I did not tell myself to become a pastor teacher just like any other pastor teacher did. me. But God assigned me a group of people because God said he makes room for my gift. So he sent me to the rest home. And for all these years, God has been constantly pouring into me that I may pour into others. While other people turn, seem to want to dim their focus around money and buildings, you have never seen me come on here to ask you for a dime. I simply preach and teach because I love people. I have no ulterior motive to say anything wrong. I study the Bible. I live by the Bible. I simply want to teach somebody so that they can become mature and be no more children tossed to and fro. This is a dangerous season for a man of God or a woman of God that wants to teach the Bible because Satan understands what a man or a woman hunger is. Let me show you some ways that man is not disciplining himself the way I say on the Lord. God gives the increase. Whatsoever you sow, you will reap. The Bible tells us in the Bible that number one is that Romans 10, 9, which is Paul's work that God gave him this sentence, that we've been born again. Let's get back to the conscience of man. Let's get to understand that God wrote you in the Lamb Book of Life. God got a book of remembrance on you. And God raised you up to do spiritual warfare. Not against people, but against Satan. That's why it says in Ephesians 10, Put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. I'm summarizing and I'm bringing it together. But your job is to stand against the wiles of the devil, not flesh and blood. Your job, by God, is to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
You cannot get any higher. You can't get any deeper revelation than that. Your job is to get to a mature position to stand against the wiles of the devil because the devil and Satan and principalities and the rulers of darkness is the enemy of the body of Christ. They've been the enemy ever since the Garden of Eden. It don't get any deeper than that. So what is happening now? What is happening now is Jesus said in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, he said they're going to be false apostles and prophets. Let me explain to you how a false apostle and a false prophet comes about. What a false apostle and a false prophet does is that Satan who sits and watch people to devour them, to steal, kill, and destroy them, he sits up and looks at the, the actions of the believer, the hunger of the believer. And the believer is not allowing the pastor teacher to teach. So what they begin to do, every revival that opens up over there, they there. Every revival that opens up over there, they there. Every church service, they there. So what they're getting is, they're getting mixed doctrine, but Satan sees their hunger. When Satan sees their hunger, they are outrunning what God has because a, a person that's in Christ is supposed to know how to wait, I say, on the Lord. So what happens is when Satan sees the hunger and the ambitions of that person, instead of Satan speaking through the spirit, he speaks through the conscience. And so he begins to talk to that person in the mind. But God talks to the person through the word. God talks to the person through what is written. God gives knowledge of what he wants the person to do from the Holy Scriptures. God tells you, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, he said the Holy Scriptures is for your reproof, for your correction, for your instruction, for your equipping. So therefore, when Satan sees you with such hunger, he begins to give audibly in your mind, he begins to give you directions on what he wants you to do till the next thing you know, you standing up before the pastor telling the pastor, God called me. And you got no knowledge because you're rejecting what God gave you called the word of God and your, your, your hunger is being driven by Satan. I know, a lot, I know that's, that's, that's over some of your head, but, but that's the truth. Been there did that. So therefore, what happens when Satan sees that you're not going to wait on God, Satan then jumps in and takes the seat to speak to you. And instead of you being a prophet, you, you title yourself a prophet, but you ain't nothing but a psychic standing in God's house telling people what Satan said instead of what God said. And instead of waiting on God to give you your gift, Satan is giving you some gifts because he saw your hunger. And then you will say, I know, but you don't know anything. You really don't know anything. Because when you stop to really think about what you know about God, if you were to take what you know about God in a subject you know about God and record yourself trying to explain what God is saying to you, 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 when you play it back, you wouldn't be able to understand it. So that means that you are outrunning your guilt. So in this day, what Satan is using to make the church false is deception by speaking to people audibly and having people listening to him audibly and having people title themselves but what is going on in this day, if God did not make you a Christian and give you the provision to be a Christian, you can call yourself a Christian all you want to, but you're not one according to God. You can't be an apostle according to God unless God supplied you with the gifting to be an apostle. So therefore, when you look, you're busy, you're busy doing a whole lot of stuff. But I'm going to talk to you for a minute. Watch this. Your decisive action should be this. You've been born again. Romans 10, 9 made sure that when you confess with your mouth and you believed in your heart, you became a Christian. 
right then, at that moment, you begin to put off the works of darkness. And you begin to put on the armor of light. You begin to put away the old man. You begin to put on the new man. You put out the old man with his doings and the present and, and present your memory unto God. You put to death your memory and you put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make and make no provisions for the flesh. You put off the body of the flesh, you put on a heart of compassion. You take up the whole armor, you put on the whole armor of God. Why? These passages describe decisive actions of the will toward things in an unseen immaterial sphere called the realm of righteousness, showing the effect in the spiritual righteous realm. Spear, S-P-H-E-R-E. -E and region of influence or activity that is spiritual, immaterial territories of influence and control, a territory over which a powerful ruler has authority, a measure of rule. 2 Corinthians 10, 13, 15, 16. In saving the man, God calls him into co-action with himself to work out his own salvation. God calls the man or the woman into co-action with himself to form a union. He wants you to bring the man or the woman of God. He wants to bring their lost will, their lost appetite, their lost desires into a union with his desires for them so that he may save them. At that point, that person can no longer begin to use the old man but put him off by living by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. The reason why they want to live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God is because the word of God is God and is holy and it sets you apart to be sanctified and it washes you of your sins. So every day in the Lord that you get the word of God and you begin to live by the word of God and every day that you endure by reading the word of God that you, and you take it upon your mind to exercise what the word of God is doing, you are putting on the new man Ephesians 4.24, Colossians 3.10, and you are pulling out the old man. Now, your conscience cannot be a part of what you are doing for God because in your conscience is your emotions, and your emotions will take you up and down like a thermometer. You're the Holy Spirit that seals you will make you steadfast, and irremovable, you won't be like a reed waving in the wind. But you will be sure that you are sure that you are sure that you heard God say, He who has begun a good work in me. If God's job is to do the good work in you, can you push God to give you an increase because you have a desire? No, you can't. You got to show him that you are worthy to have that increase. I don't care how high you want to go, how low you want to go, how far to the side you want to go. You cannot rush God. You got to wait, I say, on him. There are too many people in the pulpit. There are too many people proper line that saying God told me to do this and did not wait on their ministry, didn't wait on their gifts, didn't become mature. But are like children being tossed to and fro in a church saying hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah with no word. And then God said, because Satan is so deceptive in this season, I'm going to have to cut the time short because of my elect. I'm trying to teach that there has been a parallel shifting in the earth realm. The churches aren't preparing the people for this season. They're not preparing the people for the onslaught of falseness, and they're not teaching the people the divisiveness and the deception of Satan. Spirit on a person. 
Satan does not have to infiltrate a Christian to stop them. Satan can work from the outside. He does not have to work internally. All Satan got to do to that Christian is, is that Christian can say, I'm going to church today. And Satan will say, did you hear that? Go down there and don't stop the car from cranking. That person missed church. Didn't read the Bible because they said, well, I read the Bible later on. And Satan will say, did you hear that? Go down there and stop them from being able to read the Bible. Now, they miss church. They miss reading the Bible. They haven't prayed because Satan and his imps have got them so busy because they're working in the invisible realm causing distractions and causing them to be drunk from the curse of the world, Luke 21, 34, 35, 36, causing them to be drunk with the curse of the world. So now they've gone five days while you've got another man or woman of God over there, no matter what the distraction are, I'm going to get my word anyway if I had to put it in my CD and take it down the road with me. I'm going to get my word because I realize salvation is a great price. He paid a great price to give it to me. I got to pay a great price to have it. He laid down his life to give it. I got to lay down my life and deny Travis to have it. He laid down his life and got his life up that I may be born again. I got to give my life up and endure and being born again spiritually and not operating in the flesh that I may understand that the spiritual kingdom of God is the best way for me to have eternal life. And instead of me wanting always to be my old self, I ought to always be looking forward to being the new me. I need to be renewing my mind that I may be transformed. I need to be killing that old man every chance I get because he can't go to heaven. So there's one thing I've had in my life, whether I wanted to hear it or not, my grandma and my granddaddy didn't pull no punches. They told me about my nasty self. And when I would say, no, I don't see that, my pastor would tell me, you got that wrong. And I would tell him, no, pastor, here's what I got, such and such and such. He says, you got a little bit of the story. you got a little bit of revelation, but you haven't got the whole story. You need to go here. You need to go there. You need to bring this all together so that you may get an understanding of what God is trying to tell you. I got big-headed. I did not want to listen to my pastor. Satan saw my eagerness. And when Satan saw my hunger to know a little man caught me at the big blue store and told me, he said, come here, son. I want to talk to you. Be careful how you study that Bible. Because you will get in that Bible and you will have a hunger. And Satan will see that hunger. And Satan will step in to feel your thirst. I thought that was the craziest thing I have ever heard. See, the thing about Christianity is... I can go in the Bible, if possible, and read the whole Bible five times a night. But that does not increase me because my increase comes from God. So me reading the Bible, getting more knowledge, does not get me increase. You know what gives me increase? Reading and performing. What gives me increase? Reading with understanding to perform. And when you read with understanding to perform, the gifts of the Spirit are wrapped with the fruit of the Spirit because God has increased you to have those fruit of love, joy, meekness, humbleness. He has increased you to have the fruit to wrap with the gift. So you won't be over there shaking people like a pit bulldog, but you'll be loving them anyway. This is important because if you don't wait on the Lord to give you increase and you keep talking, Satan going to hear you. And he's going to come to give you what you ask for, but your increase ain't going to be coming from God. Your increase going to be coming from the other side. The Bible already told you 
that Satan is going to sit where he ought not to be. He's constantly sitting in the pulpit right now. He's constantly standing up in the church right now as a prophet. He's constantly standing in the corner as a deacon right now. He has disguised himself and moved into the church where he ought not be right now. Don't let him move into the throne of your heart because he sees a hunger that you got and you can't wait on the Lord. If you got knowledge to examine yourself, if you got enough word of God to examine yourself, then you can discern what another brother or another sister is talking about. If you don't have enough light of knowledge to discern truth when you hear it, you better wait on the Lord. You better wait on the Lord. You better quit being so antsy and you better wait on the Lord. Listen to me. I'm talking to the ones that are too eager and I'm talking to the ones that ain't eager enough. You know where God just brought you from. You know what you need to be doing for God. You better get serious about God. Leviticus 26 is going to be my point of reference. Whether you got too much eagerness or whether you ain't got enough eagerness, when God get through chastising you, and he will come back to chastise you, you ain't going to want that. So the best thing to do, if I don't know, I get with a good Bible-based teacher. And I might not like what he tells me. But if that's his assignment and he, and he has proved to me that God is pouring into him and he knows this Bible and I know that I know that I know he knows this Bible, I'm going to stick with him. He ain't going to be able to throw me away. I'm going to crazy glue myself to him. You know why? Because my salvation has to get me to heaven. So now, if I have to bite a stick, if I have to sit in, at his doorstep or under his feet, I'm going to do what I got to do for my salvation because I want to go to heaven. I'm trying to help Jesus do the work that he left me to do. What are you trying to do? And have you begin to do the work that Jesus left you to do? Or do you even know? What Jesus left you to do. Ephesians 6 will tell you some of it. Ephesians 1 will tell you why he chose you to get in that armor. He said because of the fullness of the dispensation of time. We're in the fullness of the dispensation of time because we're in the Gentile dispensation. And you are a Gentile. And if you are a Gentile, you're supposed to be wearing the armor. And the reason why you're supposed to be wearing the armor is because you're supposed to be standing against the wiles of the devil. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. You're supposed to be standing against the wiles of the devil. But you're letting him go because you want to fight with Miss Lucy. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. Now understand something, Ezekiel 33, and I'm going to end it right here. God told me if I see something and I sound the trumpet, the blood is off my hands. He said, but if I don't sound the trumpet, if I don't blow the trumpet, the blood of the one that I don't blow the trumpet to is on my hands. I'm not going to hell because I shit my mouth and I'm scared of people. I'm going to tell you what I see. I'm going to tell you and you and you and you and you in the next one. Because that's my job. If God had not made me a pastor teacher, I could shut my mouth. But I want to go to heaven. So now, find your place in God and make sure you know God for yourself. And if you don't, find you an apostle prophet evangelist or pastor or teacher until you are grown up and perfected in the ministry for yourself and then stand up and do your ministry. Ephesians 4.11. This past Samson, we'll see you Thursday.